Hey, good morning and happy Saturday to you. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Dr. Quinyan Nancy Scott, and she's here with the Washington Post Teacher of the Year, Christina Cook. Yes, and we are so glad that you decided to join with us again as we've decided to tackle just another topic. Before we begin with Take a Look, I do want to do a disclosure that we only represent ourselves and we do not represent the organizations that we work for. And anything that we share regarding values or views is all about us. Absolutely. All right. And so today, again, welcome to Take a Look. Yes, honey, yes. And we just want to continue part two. So last week we really talked about if the role of African-American educators in the urban school districts. And so uh, today is really dedicated to the urban teachers. Mm -hmm. And so, Cook, I okay. want to ask you, right? <laughs> what do, you, do you believe that the African-American teacher is responsible for taking on the role of being mama? Mm. That was a loaded question. Do I believe they are responsible? I don't believe they are responsible, but do I believe they make it their responsibility? Mm. The answer is yes. It is not part of their job description, but as a African-American teacher, uh, teaching children of color, we, own that room we own that space we own any stereotypes that people may say about our children so in many cases and i'm guilty i look at those students like they are my own so is there something wrong with taking on the role of being mama and does that cross a line it does it crosses the line because there are some things by law that I can't do as their teacher <laughs> and probably shouldn't do as parents. But I think we cross the line because I start to pass my middle class values on to children who maybe their parent doesn't want that for them. Or maybe their parent has a different plan for them that's different than what I want. And so I have to be careful with that. I may say something that could be offensive like hey, I don't think you should eat carry out five days a week. But if a parent wants that for their kid, then I have to accept that. And I can't judge if that's a decision that a parent wants to make for their family. <clears throat> yeah, but I also think that when you as a teacher step into the classroom, you bring all of you with them. So you use the example, your middle class values. And I think it's so important that part of you being a teacher that connects to students, um, whether you're African American or whether you're Latino or whether you're Chinese, I think the reality of it is, is that you bring all of you mm -hmm. to the table yeah. and you have a certain value mm -hmm. that that you have for your own children yeah. and for yourself and that spills into the classroom that spills mm -hmm. into curricula that spills into procedures mm -hmm. uh, typically you don't go a different way yeah. outside of how you are yeah I agree with that what do you think about the Teacher, mm -hmm. this is this is a, this is gonna be good. Get a little closer. <laughs> what do you think about the teacher that buys clothes, shoes, and or food mm. for the student because the teacher believes that they need it, or perhaps the child does need it, yeah. but is that the teacher's responsibility? No, it is not the teacher's responsibility. But, right, and I've been guilty of all of those things. Um, if I see a kid with a need, I want to fill that need to get past the barrier to get to learning. So I would keep snacks in my desk. So if a kid was hungry, like, I don't want hunger to get in the way of learning, which is my top, is, top priority is learning. So, hey, if I had a snack and you're hungry, go get it out my desk drawer. I kept um, change in my desk if a kid wanted a soda or water um, because I just didn't want those things getting in the way of the main thing, which was learning. So like as a kid, I never worried about not having food. I never worried about not having clothes. My mom provided those things, but we're dealing in a time and space where we know that's just not the case for every family. 
and the priorities just look different not judging the priorities but they just look different so if mom prioritizes hey you know it's either you get your hair done or you get your supplies right for school and you can't have both then what do you do and you and i both have had kids come to us needing help with nails for prom needing money for hair for prom or just the day-to-day -day, and we've we've obliged yeah, you know, I've grappled with this for years. Yeah. I'm thinking about um, when I was principal in Baltimore City, we were one of the first schools that had a washing machine, not for uniforms, mm -hmm. um, because that was the norm, yeah. but had a washing machine just for students in their clothing. Mm -hmm. And I even had additional social workers, um, shout out to Miss Brown, Miss Burns, and Miss Campbell. They were phenomenal. Yes, honey. Who would wash their clothes, who would fold their clothes, who yeah. ensured that there was detergent. I don't even know where the money came from for the detergent. I'm sure, that, you know, thinking back, Miss Burns, probably purchase the detergent yeah. for the students but you know I grapple with is it our responsibility we did it yeah. because it met the need right the food meets the need yeah. but the truth is I truly don't believe it's the school's responsibility yeah. to ensure there's food I'm thinking about we had a food bank and mm -hmm. the food bank had thought would drop off thousand pounds mm -hmm. of food yeah it really and it financially it impacted us. I'm yeah. thinking about prom where we did a, a prom fundraiser just so we could support other kids. Mm -hmm. But is it the school's responsibility? No, it isn't. And I think we take it on, especially those of us who really care about what we're doing because we either see ourselves in that student and we're trying to stop that student from getting bullied or talked about. And so if we can help out, we just do it. But I think we cross a lot of lines and we blur some areas with families because then here's the second part, right? Once you start doing a lot for people, then you now create this expectation of, aren't you just going to do it? Right. And so I think, I don't even know how you balance between teaching people how to be responsible and take initiative when as a school, we're often, you know, the first line of defense when something goes wrong. Yeah. Because I even had parents say to me, and let, let me tell you something, if you're one of these parents, get yourself together. When we talk about like uniform compliance, I've heard parents say if they want you to wear a uniform, then they should buy it. But you want your kid to go to this school. So there's this idea of like a parent has a responsibility, the student has the responsibility, and then of course the school has a responsibility. Yeah, but so I truly believe that over the last 30, 40 years, and I'm thinking about going back to Ronald Reagan, mm. where we have taken the responsibility from the parents, mm -hmm. and now the responsibility is 100% on the school. Mm -hmm. So it's 100% on the school. So you actually have school programs that feed the student breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. You actually have school programs that provide exposure. So you now have Girl Scouts pushing in into the school. Yeah. You now have Boy Scouts pushing into the school. You have a a plethora of after school programs that typically when I was growing up in order for you to be a part of those programs your parent had to take you mm -hmm. but now those those programs are a part of the school to make yeah. it convenient yeah. and it really takes the parent out of the equation mm -hmm. for the student to still participate yeah and it's really infiltrating our urban school districts mm -hmm. as if the parent does not have a voice yeah and now that we're in the pandemic you see this gap widening yeah that's this is real between you know parents who teachers who feel like wow i gave this child food every day mm -hmm. now what is going on with the child yeah or i know this child was being abused or traumatized mm -hmm. what is going on with the ch child yeah. so it's creating additional pressure onto the educator when in truth the educator was crossing the line yeah i agree with everything you just said and i'm just reflecting on students who i need to check up on and want to check up on like how are things going? Because I did cross the line. Because I did say, hey, here's five bucks, here's 10 bucks. Um, I don't have an answer. Because there's the, that motherly part of me that's like, I don't want to see anyone's child go without, right? It's this idea of I'm planting these seeds, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm you know, putting out the good energy on the front end um, in the hopes and prayers that on the back end, my kids would be able to receive those same... Um, acts of kindness from their teachers, not necessarily purchasing things for them, but maybe in thought and in, in words. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what do you think about this? So, mm -hmm. we have the teachers who play the parental role mm -hmm. inside of the schoolhouse. And then we truly have the teachers that one and done. Like, I go to work and yeah. then I'm out. There's this critical view about the teacher that doesn't present mm -hmm. the parental support like other yeah. teachers do. If you acknowledge that teachers that go above and beyond is crossing the line, why do you believe in some cases the teachers that don't cross the line, they're not as revered, yeah. um, they're not as acknowledged mm -hmm. as the teachers that consistently cross the line? Yeah, because the buzzword is like urgency and now and poor and they need us, right? And so that's the language surrounding urban districts, right? Like it's gonna take you, we need you, all you know all hands in all hands you know all hands on deck for this this big task that we have to take on and so it's like if you're not like fanatical about it then it's like well what are you doing and i think there are lots of teachers who still get results who have what i like to call a relaxed intensity they're able to come do their job do what they can for kids while they're there but then they have that balance and they separate to preserve their own mental health because, you know, when I'm thinking about this, Scott, there's been plenty of nights I'm thinking of rides we've had, you know, traveling back home from work where we've just really been sad about the state of education and the state of the black community. Right. And we've held on to that. Um, we have both experienced um, some trauma in our careers. And so I'm just wondering for the teacher who chooses just to check out a bit, you know, what do they know that we don't know about preserving their mental health? Right. What have they learned that maybe some of us as other educators need to learn about maybe guilt surrounding why we're doing something right? Like, are we doing it because we genuinely want to do it from our heart or are we doing it because we feel like if I don't, then I'm going to be looked upon as like I'm not true and loyal to the game. Yeah. And I think it's the latter. I think yeah. it's that if we, if we don't do this, if we don't mm -hmm. participate in the dance, if we don't give our extra money, then I am not um, as valued. Yeah. And, you know, looking back, I'm thinking about, uh, I used to do this fundraiser. The fundraiser was you can wear jeans for $20 for the entire week. Mm -hmm. And that money would then go to um, our prom mm -hmm. and students would, that needed it for the prom. And I'm thinking about, did that cross the line? Mm. So the intent was pure, right. right? The intent was that we had students that truly needed some support and we could only help maybe four or five, mm -hmm. but those four or five needed it. Yeah. But the what was the impact yeah. on the teacher who wanted to wear jeans but mm -hmm. didn't want to give up the twenty? Twenty dollars, yeah. Or how about this? Come on. Didn't have the twenty, 20 yeah. to give up, but I believe wow. that everybody had the twenty. Yeah. And I also believe why wouldn't you want to give yeah. twenty dollars to help a child when in true fact, now that it's I have hindsight, mm -hmm. it wasn't our responsibility. Yeah, I agree with you on that. So, so I'm sitting here now in this moment, I'm grappling with like then where are the parents showing up for their kids? Right? And I'm wondering now then whose responsibility is it to teach, guide, lead adults as they teach and guide and lead their children to be productive members of society? Or do we say, let it be what it's going to be? So I'm thinking about the kids like who have like matted hair or wingworm. Right? I'm just thinking of my past experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Should I have not inter intervened and said, oh, well, your mom needs to wash your hair? Or should I have called that parent and said, you know what? You know your child is struggling. But then I'm grappling with that, and that's another issue. Because then you're dealing with parents feeling like you're trying to teach me or tell me how to raise my kid. But I feel like if a kid expresses a need at school, they want help, Dr. Scott. I'm telling you. I'm thinking of a student in my class who had dirty clothes, right? And all the kids were talking about him. And I'm like, why won't his parent just wash his clothes? Mm. And he said she didn't want to. I'm thinking to myself, she doesn't want to. And I just said, give me, the, give me the uniforms. And I brought them to my home and I washed them. And I brought them back the next day. So I'm just thinking like, 
I don't know. Like, how do you deal with that? When a parent is slacking in their just normal parental duties. So I would say that there are local agencies mm -hmm. to provide support. Yeah. And in even some cases, there are schools where schools make provision to help those particular yeah. um, students. But there's gaps though. So I'm thinking yeah. about one of the gaps is the student has a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. And so they don't, it's just between you and yeah. the student. The other thing is that you as the adult may not trust the person who is responsible. Yeah. Or once it's released to you, what that person will, or once you release it to someone else, what that person may do. Yeah. So because your lack of trust or their lack of trust, mm -hmm. it impacts helping the student. So yeah. you just do the quick thing and say, I'll help the student it. myself. Yeah. I'll take care of it myself. Um, and a shout out to all the educators that do that because I yeah. think that although I am evaluating whether or not you should or you shouldn't, the truth of the matter is students are dying and students have been able to live because yeah. of people like you who've been able to help students along the way. And I'm sure there are thousands, I would even say millions of stories across mm -hmm. the world where had it not been for an educator, yeah. the student would not have been successful and in some cases even survived. Yeah. Um, in this pandemic, I'm thinking about what's the impact of what happens when there is no teacher there. Yeah. Well, we're seeing the impact on a daily basis. Well, oh, I don't think we've seen it yet because <laughs> we really haven't seen students. Right. But for what we can see through the camera. Oh, uh, okay. Through the camera. I'm sorry. <laughs> we can see unhappy, unkempt children um, and we can see frustrated parents who have to assist their kid with their education because they believe that that is the school's responsibility and it's funny how we're grappling with do we think certain things are our responsibility but I'm thinking about how the parent feels education is solely on us and so I'm thinking, hmm, if I send a kid home with homework, you're home with them, they may need your assistance. And if you only think it's my job to help your child learn, then we have a bigger issue at hand than I thought. And we do. So, <laughs> a couple of years ago, and, and we're just going back like two or three years, we were, we were working together. Yep. I did this survey, and the survey was... As a parent, do you believe the ownership of the partnership? What's the, the question was around partnership. Mm -hmm. What's the partnership between you and the school? Yeah. Is the partnership 50-50, equally 50% on the school, 50% on the parent? Mm -hmm. Is the partnership, and I use the stakeholder partner and student together. Yeah. Is the partnership 100%, mm -hmm. meaning that it's 100% on the school no matter what? Yeah. Or is the partnership 80-20? 80% mm. the school and 20% the parent. And how I arrived at the 80-20 was identifying the day yeah. that this typically the, the, the parent is, the student is with the school between 8 to 4. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the student typically, I'd say, went to sleep at midnight. Yeah. So you're fin finding that the student spends the majority of their day really at the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. What did the survey say? They said that 100% of it is on the school. They said 80-20. Yeah, I right? can believe that. So a little over 100 people were surveyed, and they said 80-20. But I was annoyed. Yeah. Let me get I was annoyed by the 80-20. Yeah. And shocked. That, yeah. I think I'm concerned, too, like... <laughs> I'm careful about a lot of the food that I put in my body and my children's body. So if I'm that nitpicky about if something has high fructose corn syrup in it, why would I be so trusting of a stranger? Because think about it. We are strangers to your children until we're not strangers. Does that make sense? Every year your kid meets a new adult that they might not have known before. And you leave the responsibility of educating values, all those things on a person that you're not quite sure what they really believe to be true. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example with my own children. 
I've been eavesdropping in their Zoom classes throughout the day, and I'm listening to teachers complain, like uh, the gym teacher complained to the students that all the other teachers got supplies and all she got was a ball. So in my mind, I'm thinking, dang, if I was at school or I wasn't home and I couldn't hear that, I wouldn't be able to get on top of the fact that that teacher needs to get a checkup from the neck up and keep her personal opinions about what the school is or isn't doing to herself. That's not my kid's business. And so I'm wondering how many other parents are just sitting there like, oh, well, it's okay. No, it isn't okay. It isn't okay for a teacher to express that type of, um, you know, um, negativity, negativity in, in the classroom. Teach to kick, kick the ball, sis. Kick the ball. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think that, that, you know, children right now need so much more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I think about the 80-20, parents have had, it's now switched. Right, mm -hmm. it's really 2080, and the ball is really in the parents' court. And for many parents, they don't they feel that they're not comfortable educating their child, and so there's some gaps, or in many cases, they don't have time because they're working, um, they don't have the know how to provide the same understanding of knowledge that they mm -hmm. believe the school would, and so they truly believe that the school is going to make a comeback and the school is going to fill in those gaps. No, it's not going to happen. And I'm telling you, it's not. If I've ever had a PSA, <laughs> like if I ever wanted to say, tell me. Public service announcement, please hear me. Yeah. The hear me is please make sure you are working with your children because the school system is going to be unable to close those gaps. Yeah. Like typically a school system can only close a gap for one year. Yeah. So if you're in fourth grade and you're reading on a third grade level, no, here's a better example. Mm -hmm. If you're in sixth grade and you're reading on a third grade level, which is very real, mm -hmm. then typically a school would only be able to close that gap for one year. Mm -hmm. And that's pushing it, right? That's working with the child beyond the school day. That's extra tutorial support, but that's only a one year increase. So now we're looking at that there may be gaps for two and three years. Mm -hmm. The school can't do it by themselves. No, they can't. I don't care how much you like your child's teacher, yes. you have to step in. You do. And part of that is Cook said, you know, why is it that parents don't parents really don't know the teacher well think about this survey time come on when's the last time you were at your child's school Ooh. and i'm not talking about the pick up a computer Boop. we're not talking about like picking up the latest device we're talking about you wanted to meet your child's teacher when's the last time you sent your child's teacher an email come on because come on. you just wanted to check in Dang. But we put the onus on the school. Oh, yeah. Um, I haven't heard any good phone calls from the school. Correct. I only hear bad phone calls. Correct. The school is checking on me. And now schools are being tied professionally, mm -hmm. over-communicate, over-communicate. Yep. And you hear parents complaining, I got five I phone calls go. from the school. <laughs> You have to de determine that like good communication and good partnership means that mm -hmm. people overly communicate, people check on one another. And what does that mean? That the school isn't trying to do anything, but the school really wants you to buy in Correct. to what's going on because they're really trying to help and support your child. And to add on to that, that's why there's so many platforms for you to have access, right? Mm -hmm. Parents complain, we need access. Well, that's what power school is for. So like, as soon as I get that notification to my phone, I'm checking in with two people, my kids, and then if I need to send an email on their behalf, and I'm checking in with the teacher, right? I'm not waiting um, for the teacher to tell me what's wrong. I'm diagnosing the problem and reaching out to the teacher like, hey, I noticed this is happening. And you don't have to be a teacher in order to do that. You just have to be observant mm -hmm. and involved. And we need more parents to get involved in this process because at the end of the day, that's your child. That's your legacy. Right. And our job as parents is to set our kids up for the best success possible and give them the environment to do that. And we can't do that if we're not involved. Right. I don't care how many jobs you have to work. Right. That's everybody's story. Everybody's working. But what's more important to you, your job or your child? And I think the grapple, right, yeah. is I need my job in order to help take care of my child. Well, I'm going to add on to that. You need income. Now, whether you get it from your job or you get it from something else, 
you need the income, right? And so I say that to you all respectfully as someone who sits here with a master's degree who was willing to work at Walmart, okay? If I had to, to get those nighttime hours in order to be home with my kids. So we have to start making those type of decisions like this is life or death, right? Dr. Scott uh, posed to the staff years ago that without education, you have nothing, you, you die. And so that's the state of America right now. We are in a dire situation where if you don't have a good education, you don't have access to resources or people or networks, you, as Joe Clark said and lean on me, you are going to become a permanent underclass, period. Well, with that said in mind, <laughs> you know, um, we uh, truly appreciate you tuning in to us as always, um, don't forget, take a look. Remember to check us out on Saturday mornings. Uh, and we look forward to spending more time with you. Feel free to inbox us questions mm -hmm. as we move forward. Our true goal is getting out quality information yes. because we want you to be well equipped to support whether it's your own child mm -hmm. or whether it's your students. Again, take a look. We'll see you next Saturday. Bye. Bye.